The dawn of literalism. Part duh. Here we go. Okay, so the triangle shirtwaist fire. Um, shirtwaists were women's blouses that were very popular at the turn of the 20th century, tucked into high skirts, high waisted skirts that um, went down to your ankles. Um, ooh, it was so scandalous to show your ankles. Uh, as we saw in the video earlier in the Industrial Revolution, the fire itself um, was pretty devastating. Women were trapped in like the fourth floor. The only outlet of the building was the elevator. Fire escapes were either non-existent or locked. Very combustible textile factories. And in fact, we've even had some recent textile factory fires in places like Bangladesh that have, and India that have been very devastating. So here you can see the destruction after the fire. And with this new media, it was outrageous. All of these women, over 100 of them, died, some jumping to their deaths. So what was the significance? It exposed the hazardous conditions in New York City factories and resulted in the passage of building and safety codes and created stiff penalties for noncompliance with those codes. Um, like I said, it made the front page of the news. The city was devastated and in mourning um, as a result of all of this. So you had more push for factory f reforms. Um, Florence Kelly uh, was a factory inspector and she headed the National Consumers League and pushed for legislation protecting women and children in the workplace. And you also had the Supreme Court case Mueller versus Oregon. And this is where factory workers in Oregon um, were, or the factories were in violation of Oregon laws that, that had been passed, which were actually quite sexist, that said that women could not work longer hours and late into the night. And these women sued um, and said that they were in violation of the Oregon laws um, by having these factories have them work. Um, unfortunately, they were kind of backwards, but it did start to create um, a work day, time schedule, the eight hour work day, etc. You also had municipal reform where public utilities, cities rather than private companies, were starting to own things like. Um, trash cleanup, sewer systems, water systems, power plants, gas lines, etc., and transportation lines. You also had um, the reform of urban politics, and this was part of getting rid of the um, political machines, was the city manager system was introduced. And this is where you had a city council who would then hire a city manager who would then run different departments, whether it's transportation, sewage, police, etc. And it was to sort of take the political partiness out of these uh, cities. In the state, you had the Women's Christian Temperance or Union, Women's Christian Temperance Union, uh, led by Frances E. Willard, um, pushing across the nation to get prohibition passed. And again, this was part of that social gospel. Alcohol was the ill of all society and by 1950 two-thirds of the states had prohibited the sale of alcoholic beverages and the temperance organizations were actually successful in getting the 18th amendment passed um, and here's the motto of the women's christian temperance union for god and home and every land national reform you had the square deal coming from the roosevelt and that's Teddy Roosevelt administration. And it was based on the three C's, control of corporations, consumer protection, and conservation of natural resources. So some acid tests for the square deal were the 1902 Pennsylvania coal miner strike. Would it work? Would these things be able to prevent and get people back to work, etc.? Roosevelt was viewed as a trust buster. He was the first president to enforce the Sherman Antitrust Act and actually to use it not to destroy big business, but to break up bad trusts, in some case unions, um, that were viewed to be harming the public and stifling competition, and to regulate good trusts to provide efficiency and low-priced goods. The railroads, which were some of the biggest trusts in the nation, um, were another place where Roosevelt tried to reform um, our policies. He strengthened the Interstate Commerce Commission. Congress passed the Elkins Act of 1903, which stopped 
railroads from granting rebates to favored customers. Hayburn Act of 1906, um, actually Senator Hayburn was from the great state of Idaho and he was actually a notorious railroad man who was often um, giving kickbacks. He was not a big fan of Teddy Roosevelt or a lot of his ideas. But the Hayburn Act of 1906 said that a commission could be created to fix just and reasonable rates for railroads. People were sort of hamstrung by the rates that the railroads were charging for freight and for just general transportation. Consumer protection. Well, what was the original goal? To provide safe food, transportation, and goods um, to citizens of the United States. And part of this is coming from another book that was pushed and published by one of the muckrakers, which is called The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. And it details sort of the horrors that our meatpacking industry was at the turn of the century, primarily in the Chicago meatpacking industry. Almost all cattle was being shipped to Chicago via railroads, and that is where they were then sold and slaughtered and then shipped to stores across the country. And it was in this place that people really realized that um, our food supply was not very safe. So the Roosevelt administration started to investigate and check into it, and they passed the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 and the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 as well. The other thing that Roosevelt was a big fan of was conservation. He really believed that our na nation's forests were an asset to be protected for future generations. Now that was a very unpopular idea at the time. Um, prior to that, we had the Desert Land Act of 1877, the Forest Reserve Act of 1891, and the Cary Act of 1894. Teddy Roosevelt's managed to get past the New Lands Act of 1902, which provided money from the sale of public lands to irrigation projects in western states. So this is the beginning of the irrigation of the west, turning it into what we now call the Cadillac Desert, which is a great book you could read for extra credit if you felt like it. Other conservation achievements, he establishes the first 51 bird reserves, four game preserves, and 150 national forests. The national forests up here were extremely controversial. I'm reading a book currently called The Big Burn about those national forests in the 1910 forest fire. Um, and it was the biggest forest fire in the nation and just absolutely devastating. But people still did not want the national forest. There's always been tension between the government and the states with regards to that. He also created the National Forest Service and established five new national parks. He signed the 1906 Antiquities Act, which he proclaimed 18 national monuments, and an area of the United States was protected uh, under Theodore Roosevelt was approximately 230 million acres that would have gone to private citizens and corporations had he not done that. So this is his biggest achievement. Teddy Roosevelt is most known for his conservation efforts. Again, you can read The Big Burn if you would like to read more about that. It's very readable and very interesting. He wanted to use natural resources wisely. He um, was working on two battlefronts to prevent greedy commercial interests such as mining and logging interests who abused the resources and he was also sort of you had these romantic preservationists like John Muir at the time who felt like it all should be protected for everything and not used for any sort of commercial interests. Um, his plan called for a multi-use resource management owned by the federal government but allowing mining and logging interests in limited amounts in those areas. Um, so it was kind of an interesting and a new way to view our natural resources. And that's the end of part two.